it's an incredibly powerful piece of filmmaking, and I think that the evening is gonna get a lot more powerful in many ways, if it could, because we're gonna have some of the creators and some of the, the cast members of When They See Us up here on the stage in just a few moments. But I would like to introduce someone. I do not have the pleasure of moderating this wonderful panel today. I'm just your front pitch man. <laughs> Who knows math? Um, and and I, hope you, I, hope, I hope you pay attention to some of that math, because it's very important that five young men were, were arrested, charged, and convicted of a terrible crime that they did not commit in this country 30 years ago. And this story is even more powerful today, which is sad to say, but so necessarily true. And I want to introduce a very, very good friend of the director, co-writer, creator, executive producer, kind of everything of this, of Ava DuVernay's. This is a gentleman that she met in 2014, without trying to name drop too much, in the White House, um, when she had a little film called Selma that had come out, and there was a reception for it that was held by a very, very wonderful man who we so sadly miss called President Barack Obama. <laughs> These two, these two people became very, very close friends. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you your moderator for this evening. And I generally say at deadline, we don't say the word Star Wars during any time, but ladies and gentlemen, Mr. J.J. Abrams. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so we are here tonight to discuss the uh, limited series uh, when they see us, but of course, uh, Limited is not quite the word I think of uh, when I think of, of this extraordinary work. Um, the depth of, of character, the importance of the subject matter, the power of its ugly truths, the beauty of its execution, the heart and soul that went into making it, uh, these are limitless things. Uh, it's very few times in our culture does something come along that just stops us in our tracks. and. And, and reveals truths that so many knew to be true and so many more did not. And this incredible uh, series that Ava, some of the people you're gonna meet tonight, and of course so many more uh, have put together, weirdly kind of feels inevitable in this impossible way. I mean, the, the pain of it, the, the anguish, the agony of it, and yet the, the way it was, it was made, you cannot look away. And that is an act of remarkable filmmaking tightrope walkery that uh, just blows my mind and breaks my heart. And uh, so anyway, it is a, it's an honor to be here to talk about the series. Uh, after watching all, all four parts, you know, I was gut punched like everyone. Uh, I had no words. And yet here I am in a position to say words <laughs> and to talk to people and ask questions all of them seem so trite, you know? And this is, I know in any conversation, but this is much more than that, uh, this piece. And I just feel honored to be here, so I wanna thank you for coming, thank you for having me, and uh, I'd like to introduce some of the uh, extraordinary people who uh, worked on this. First, the uh, composer, Mr. Uh, Chris Bowers. Look, it's Chris Bowers. Uh, I think I'll take 40 minutes just to answer. Uh, I'll do it quickly. Um, the uh, actress who played uh, Miss Linda McRae, uh, Marsha Stephanie Blake, is here. Uh, the actor who played young Kevin Richardson, uh, Asante Black is here. Uh, the extraordinary actor who played, sorry. The actor who played uh, Corey Wise, both young and old, uh, Gerald Jerome is here. The actress who played Dolores Wise, uh, Nisi Nash. Nisi. Uh, the 
the, uh, the actress who played uh, Sharon Salam, Anjana Ellis. And the, uh, the extraordinary filmmaker who made it all happen is Ava DuVernay. series has garnered 16 Emmy nominations and we have with us uh, well, here, here. Um, we have four first time Emmy nominees uh, here with us yes Good, so congratulations uh, amazing. Um, I, I honestly don't know quite where to start except to ask you uh, what I want to say is how and just like sit back and listen for hours um, I guess my, my question first question is what what was the thing that made you know this was the thing to do next? And, and what were you most afraid of when you began? These are so many questions. <laughs> it is, because it's truly um, the kinds of things that we do when we're trying to interrogate an idea and figure out if you're gonna move forward with it or not. So thank you for being here, my friend. I'm glad you're here. Just before I start, I wanna thank you all for being here, because this place is packed. <laughs> 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 audience, so if you worked on or touched when they see us, including some of our actors who are over here, uh, please stand up. Let them see me. Selma would I consider uh, my next film being Central Park Five. And I get a lot of tweets. But the reason why this stayed with me was because when I was 16 years old, Corey Wise was 16 years old. This was happening to him in 1989 in Harlem. And I was growing up in Compton here on the West Coast. And it was what we were talking about in the neighborhood, what was going on with these brothers um, in New York. And so when I got the tweet from Raymond Santana, whose handle was Central Park Five, I said, wow, this is one of them. And um, we started to communicate, and when I met him and then met all the men, there was no way that I couldn't do it. It was their stories, their faces, their families, their memories, their legacy um, that really just called me to make sure that it was uplifted and made into a film that we could all understand. And, uh, how much have you kept in contact with the Exonerated Five? Like, what's that been like since? Okay, we have an epic Twitter chain uh, that goes back maybe four years now. And then I have individual ones with each of them. Um, and so it's funny. Uh, well, we talk every day. We text every day. And I usually talk with them about once a week. I talk to Corey a little bit more than that. I talk to Raymond a little bit more than that. I'm the closest to the two of them. But we all talk. Um, I talk to Antron about once a week. Um, they just became part of my family. They're my friends now. And um, when I called them to tell them about the Emmys, none of them knew about it. It was like an hour later. <laughs> and they're in the time zone, they're in, on the East Coast in Atlanta and New York, and I called them and I was like, so? <laughs> right? And they're like, hey, what's up? It's <laughs> the Emmys, and literally I had to explain to them what it was. Um, you know, for one of them I had to say it's like the Grammys, but for TV, oh, what? <laughs> and that was sobering to me because we really put this on a, on a pedestal. Um, but for real people in real places, it was really about the story and the way that that story and the reception to it has impacted their lives, you know, separate and apart from any, 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 any other laudatory celebrations. And so it was really touching, but they are all my date for the Emmys. So I'll have, I'll have them all come back. Uh, 
this piece is obviously about these five, uh, not extraordinary young men, but ordinary young men, and what how they became extraordinary and what they went through. But it's also about their families, so much about their mothers. Uh, as a, a parent, it was particularly, um, uh, I mean, first of all, as a white dude, I gotta say, <laughs> watching this thing, I felt like I knew stuff. And once again, you've enlightened me in a way that just floored me. Uh, and my whole family, and again, watching that together with the kids, you know, with Katie and the kids, and we were all just stunned and, you know, speechless for so long. Um, but the way you captured the family uh, dynamic was so incredible. I was wondering, wondering Andre, um, how did you begin to approach playing someone who is, is a real life person, who is here and went through something that was just so brutal? Um, hello everybody, good evening. Um, I talked to Ms. Salam for a good while, probably this time last year. And um, I think Ms. Salam is, was a warrior um, waiting for a movement. And unfortunately that movement had to be her own son. Um, she, I see Miss Salam in the same way that I see Angela Davis. If you look at old tapes of Miss Salam talking, that's who she reminds you of. That's the spirit that runs uh, through her. Um, one of the things I talked to her about was I talked to her about this responsibility that African Americans are supposed to have in face of this kind of criminality, which is to forgive. And I said, how do you feel about that, Ms. Salam? And she said, well, for me to forgive, I would have to forget. In order for me to forget, someone would have to cut that out of my brain. So this is someone who lives with this. She still lives in the same building where we shot. Same building, so she'd come downstairs and go back up to her room. So um, she had a tremendous love for her son but she also had this spirit running through her that she learned in Alabama. She came from the Civil Rights Movement in Alabama. So, like I said, she was a warrior, um, and a movement found her. And I, I, I'm so honored that I got to be her voice, if just for a little bit. And, and was she with you? <laughs> was she with you when you were filming, and would you have conversations if she was, would you have conversations during the scene? A little bit. I was I was a little scared of Miss Long. <laughs> and I just knew how you doing <laughs> uh, it's the same question. I mean that there were some of the most uh, gut wrenching scenes between you and, and uh, your character and, and Corey and uh, I'm just curious what what that was like to lose yourself because you were so convincing and so incredible in the role. I'm just curious what that was like to go to that emotional depth and that kind of pain. Well, for me, good evening. Um, for me to portray Dolores Wise, it definitely cost me something as an artist because I spend, spent the primary portion of my career making people laugh. So being funny and being known for being funny, I really wanted to make sure that people understood that I could play another note. And then, come on now. Don't let nobody tell you you can't do nothing. I know I can do it. I but I wanted to make sure that, you know, because we are carrying um, a burden for people who are still with us. Some, some of these characters are still living, so you, there's a responsibility that comes along with that caliber of work. And I wasn't really prepared for what I would take home at the end of the day, you know? And I don't know, how many people in here have seen part four? Okay, well you know, me and this, my baby, um, <laughs> You know, we, we had a very hard scene in four where when he reaches over to touch me and they drag him out and I'm telling him to pray and he's saying, come see me more. And we were just talking about this earlier, how after we worked all day and we got down to the end of it and you were so emotional and you're, you're high, you know, in your feelings. And then it's like, 
that's a good night to Jarell and Nisi. And you are so charged, and it was just like, good night, everybody. <laughs> It was definitely challenging because I don't usually live in that place. But I, I welcomed it with open arms, number one, because first of all, Ava is everything. Every single thing. And because she is every single thing, you and you know that these boys went through something that was so horrific. You want to show up with the best parts of yourself to be of service. And we all showed up every day in service to the work. It was not easy, but it was absolutely necessary. Thank you. Jarell. Jarell. Oh, come on. Come on. Uh, so you, uh, you had to play this, this man uh, from this unbelievably sort of innocent moment uh, through you know his experience that uh, was utterly devastating uh, as, as a young adult and my question is uh, you did it so extraordinarily you you went uh, you played this range it felt like years had passed it felt like you, know, you just were you transformed in a way that was um, stunning and and seemingly effortless and I know that that's not what it was and I'm just curious what your process was, what your experience was, how you went about it, because uh, I think you just blew everyone away. Thank you so much, Pleasure. It means a lot to me. Um, hey, everybody. Hey. How are you guys? Good. Um, yeah, so portraying Corey Wise was by far the hardest thing I've ever had to do um, emotionally physically because it required bumping out for a while, mentally. Um, but for for me, spending time with Corey Wise was everything I needed to, to stay grounded. Um, he became way more than just a character on a page to me. He's become a mentor, he's become an inspiration of mine, someone I can look up to and look uh, towards for help. And for me, it's crazy, because I met Corey Wise at um, the table read. Ava put together a table read for the cast, and the, the real men were there. Everyone except Kevin Richardson, he was in Disneyland with his kids, which is amazing. <laughs> so, um, but the four men were there, so the first time I got to read Corey Wise's lines out loud with the voice that I tried to find for him, it was right next to him. Um, and I remember ending the table read, and he was crying so much, and I had no idea what to say, and I came up to him, and I was just speechless. I just, I, I didn't know what to do. And he looked at me, and he, and he took the chain off of his neck, and he put it on mine. And he goes, you're Corey Wise now. You're the king, because he called himself the king. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second that moment happened, I knew that there was so much responsibility and so much that I needed to do to make sure that people understood that this was the type of person he was. He just listened to an hour and a half of the most brutal moments of his life, and he finished it by taking his chain off of his neck and giving it to the actor. So that kind of man, I knew I had to try my best to convey. It was a multi-step process. It was finding his voice. It was finding the way he moves and the way he talks. And so I'm very uh, grateful for Ava for giving me the time to spend with him. But um, yeah, it was, it's, it's almost hard to say it in five minutes, but it's very, um, it, was, it was a whole lot. Um, I also worked out, I had to like, I don't hit the gym, all right? Uh, it's not a thing, uh, you know. You give me some money and I'll go to the gym. You know? <laughs> like, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of physical work, it was a lot of mental work, um, but it was all for Corey Wise, and um, I, can, I can never, ever take this experience back, and I will never want to. For me, the takeaway from that is that someone can pay you to go to the gym. Yes. Yes. Yeah, pay me to go to the gym. That's my bottom line. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure that that's, that's my bottom line. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so if if someone does a uh, a Google search for Asante Black to see what other things uh, you've done, <laughs> uh, you see when they see us, and you see Entertainment Tonight Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is unbelievable that this is the first thing that you have done. Unbelievable. And I think the 
there's something about y your performance that is, in a way, sort of the way into yeah. the piece. Yeah. Um, and your your innocence in it, your the truth, um, when you say, is my mom here? You know, there are these moments that literally I, I start to tear up thinking about. Um, and you just, uh, you, you found a way to do what is, you know, and every actor up here will tell you this, and they've all done more than entertainment in our Canada. <laughs> um, that, that is a really, I mean, to be true on screen is just a gift that you either have or you don't, and you have it, sir. Uh, amazing, amazing. Thank you. Uh, you what, what it was like for you when, when you were starting this, uh, having not done it before, what, what's it been like for you since? And how did you connect to Kevin? How did you, what, what was it for you? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that. That means the world. Hi, guys. Ah, uh, oh man, I remember, uh, okay, let's start the audition process. So I had, I, okay, so I had gotten a, if you guys don't know, I look a, a lot younger than I am, but I just graduated high school recently. Um, <laughs> so, he's a man. <laughs> no, but okay, so I was, it was summer before senior year when I started auditioning, and I almost wasn't able to go to the audition because I I have five or four younger siblings along with my two parents, so you know that's a whole household to run. Uh, the world doesn't revolve around me, you know. Um, but I was yeah I was almost not able to go to the audition because my parents had work, um, and so I, I kind of realized the magnitude of how important this project was, and I started calling up all of my family. Hey, can we take the bus to New York tomorrow? Hey, can we do this? Can we do this? Uh, and thankfully, my Uncle Josh replied and said, yeah, I'll see you 5 a.m. tomorrow. And um, I actually went into the audition. I, I was auditioning first for uh, Young Corey. Um, and this is when he thought it was going to be, well, when Ava thought it was going to be Young Corey and Old Corey. Uh, and so I was auditioning for Young Corey for months. Um, it was maybe like three months went by where I was kind of had multiple auditions. I had the first audition I thought I did horrible. And I said, okay, you know, next time. Um, but then uh, Ava said that she wanted to Skype me. I was like, me? Um, are you sure? So we, we got on a Skype call. Uh, you know, my, my dear friend was with me, um, did be side with me, and that went great. And then she said she wanted to see me in, in, in LA uh, for a director session. And I was so scared, I was shaking my boots. Um, but I, I guess, you know, I guess I did okay. Uh, this, is, this is still for Corey, and um, we kind of just talked about the project, things like that. And then another week goes by, and we get an email from Ava's team saying they want me to audition for young Kevin. Um, you know, this guy already had, had, had picked up Corey, but they wanted me to audition for young Kevin. And so I was, you know, I was like, okay, I don't know what this means in the acting industry. They're just giving it to me just to do it, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put myself on tape, so. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> So I put myself on tape. I was actually, I was reading the sides for Kevin and I found that I connected with Kevin on a different level than I did with any of the other um, men. You know, Kevin was, he was the youngest of the five and you can kind of see uh, a lot of the innocence through him. You know, he looks up to his big sister, loves playing trumpet. He's kind of like, you know, he just wants to fit in. He wants to go along with the cool kids at this time of his life, you know? Um, and I was like, oh wow, you know, before I kind of came into what I figured out I wanted to do, um, I was kind of like Kevin, you know? I, I, don't, I wanted to fit in, I wanted to fit in with the cool kids, you know? Like I said, I mean, I'm this short, skinny kid, everybody thinks I'm 14, I'm 17, so this has been happening my whole life, you know? Um, but, yeah, no, I, I really found, found that I could connect with Kevin in a different way. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put my all on this tape. And I, I felt like I really gave it my best shot. And about a week later, I was sitting on the couch watching Netflix, ironically. And, uh, and Ava DuVernay herself called my personal cell phone. And I freaked out. I freaked out. Um, you know, I was, I, I mean, I, I was in such disbelief. And I remember ending that phone call and Ava said, see you in two weeks, huh? How much time do I have? Um, I mean, I was so scared. 
you know, this is my first ever project. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, still am a newcomer in this business and I had no idea kind of how to level with these, these legends that I'm playing with. You know, these are guys that have graced the screen for so long and here I am doing my first ever thing. Um, I was, you know, I'm, I'm kind of shaking right now because I'm still nervous thinking about it. Um, but I, I really kind of tried to tell myself, you know, this isn't about you, you know? This isn't the Asante Black story, you know? All that you have to do is show up and put your best foot out there and everything will unfold as it needs to. And um, I'm, I'm so happy to say that everything has been unfolding as it needs to. Um, you know, I, so, so many things have, have uh, I, I learned so much on the set, you know, Ava's just, I, I, I love working with you so much. I cannot wait to do it a thousand more times in the future. Um, you know, I, I really feel like. With, with Asante, we say, thanks hey, Asante, with, with Asante, we say, from high school to the Emmys. I mean, literally, yeah. it's his first. He graduated, he was, he was a high school student, and now he's an Emmy nominee. Yeah. So, thanks for doing So, Marsha, uh, Miss Linda McRae, uh, just an incredible uh, gut punch performer. Um, um, I'm just curious what your experience was. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, it's such a silly thing to say. How is this different from doing? But um, playing that role, that character, uh, I'm just curious what what your approach was, what your process was, as much as you can talk about it. Well, um, uh, hi. Uh, what's wonderful about this, first of all, is I don't know a lot of these stories, so what's great is hearing everyone's way into the characters and also like your experience with auditioning. I, I didn't know that story so beautiful. Um, so this is really nice. Um, I, I was lucky enough, Ava put me on a call with Miss Linda, who uh, recently passed away. Um, uh, she put me on a call with Miss Linda, it was Michael, uh, Miss Linda and Ava and I. And um, what I remember, she started out the conversation by saying, I don't like to talk about this. And we had been warned, we had been forewarned that she didn't. Um, and I think Ava had said something like, you know, keep it brief, 20 minutes. We ended up talking to her for a lot longer than 20 minutes. The truth is, when she started talking, she was incredibly giving and generous and um, shared such personal, emotional, traumatic parts of herself. Um, and I remember, I remember thinking in the phone call, she made me cry, she made me laugh. She, I I'd heard from Ava that she was this tiny woman but she had this raspy voice and she was strong, you know? Um, just, just this little force. I'm Jamaican and in Jamaican, uh, in Jamaica we call them a tegarek. I don't, I don't know if there are any Jamaicans here. But it, a tegarek is someone who is so tiny but they are full of power. It's like a little Tasmanian devil. Um, and she was just full, you could just tell. I never ever got to meet her, which is, uh, just breaks my heart to think about that. Um, but I, I, that conversation made me think, okay, this is someone who is not just strong, um, but vulnerable also. A lot of the strength is, is, is masking this incredible vulnerability because she also said she didn't like to be photographed and because of everything that had happened, um, she wanted to live a private life and it took Ava and Oprah and you know, women, these queens, to convince her to do this thing, and thank God because um, she she really would have, I think, preferred to disappear into a private, a more private life. Um, but once she knew this was happening, she gave me so much to work from, and then I got a chance to speak to her son. I got a chance to speak to her friends. Um, people would come up to me on set or at, at events and tell me about, tell me different stories about her. Um, she told us stories about her, her marriage with Bobby and how she always felt like he was her husband um, and that, you know, when he wanted to come back home, she, the door was open because she, that was her husband. Um, her relationship with Antron, her only child, 
for her house to have gone from being filled with all this male energy to being completely empty for years. It was just, uh, the heartbreak of it, it's, it's, when I think about it, I mean, it, it's, it's something that as a mom, I can't even imagine. Um, and I think the only way I was able to, to, to do it um, was Ava, who is, she will, <laughs> she will hold you up when you are falling apart. Um, she is just one of those characters. She cries with you. She'll, she'll watch a take. She will come to give you a note, and she's crying. Um, she, she's just feeling everything you're feeling, so you never feel like you're alone out there and like pushing towards something for no reason. You always feel like someone is out there to catch you. Um, so there's that. And then, this wonderful relationship that um, Michael and Khalil and I had. Um, I, I just I, I just always felt very safe, but I also knew that at the end of the day, I was pretending at something that someone had gone through. So the responsibility for me was to get it right and do it with love and kindness and honor it because as, as traumatic as it was for us to play at it, real people have gone through it. So, I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> uh, Chris, the, uh, the score is uh, phenomenal. It is... Uh, <laughs> process was, uh, when you became involved, what your, uh, what your experiences what experience was of making, a, scoring this incredible uh, piece. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hey, everybody. Um, yeah, well, uh, I first got an email from my agent saying that Ava wanted to have a meeting. I think it was like tomorrow. She wanted to meet with me and I, I didn't know what I had on my schedule. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm there. And, um, uh, a mentor of mine named Jason Moran, who's an incredible jazz pianist, he's been a mentor of mine for like over 10 years. Um, and he is Ava's musical brother. He, he did Selma with her in 13th, and he was originally on this project and had to step away because of touring and things like that. And so she asked me to come in. In that first meeting, um, she basically said, I want you to sit down and watch it, and I want us to have a conversation because, you know, no matter what you've done or whoever recommended you or whatever, I want to make sure that you understand this project on, on the level that needs to be understood and that you can give it what it needs to be given and, and respected and, and all of that. And um, that first time I watched it, that just the first episode, I came in and started talking to her. I couldn't even control myself. I started crying uh, talking about it just because of how, I mean, what, what all of these, these actors did. And <clears throat> that first time we talked about it, I talked about what, how I might approach it and wanting to take more references from horror films because I felt like what was what was happening was so horrific and and um, trying to figure out how to create these these gut-wrenching sounds and taking instruments um, like taking trumpet or, or saxophone and cello and all this stuff and having musicians play the, the weirdest things on their instruments and then taking those sounds and stretching them and doing weird things with them just because I felt like that was what was happening to these these people on screen and um, and then ultimately the rest of the process uh, really was just trying not to mess up what they did. I think that there were so many times, very honestly, where I was watching the scenes while I was working and my process, usually I'll watch it with the tent music that we will talk about and what we like about it, what we don't and all that. And then I'll watch it without any music. And there's so many times where I'm watching these scenes over and over again and getting incredibly emotional while I'm watching it and feeling things in certain place and places. And then I would add music and then I'd watch it again and be like, I don't feel all the stuff that I felt without any music. And so obviously the music is now detracting or, or uh, hurting what's happening. And so then it was just about trying to continue to like erase or carve or try to find ways to like, to you know let what's happening on screen happen and find moments where maybe the music can come out a little bit more. But, and, and that's also where Ava was so incredible um, as a director because a lot of times directors, especially you know, it's a TV show, we don't have that much time, and, and a lot of times directors are like, just do something like the tenth, and you know, as long as it's close to the tenth, then I'm, I'm happy, essentially. And uh, and she was just so specific 
but at the same time, really gave me a lot of autonomy and freedom to do it however I wanted to do it. She was ex uh, explicit and specific about the emotions that she wanted to feel. So there are times where we'd watch a scene with my cue that I would write or a demo that I wrote, and she was like, right here where you know uh, Marsha and, or Antron and his mom hug, we don't really feel, I don't feel what I felt before, why is that? So then we would step back and look at the pacing of, of, of them walking and, and should there be a release as soon as they hug or when there's a cut to this shot, should there be, you know, should we move this piano note right here or do things like that? But then after a while, especially when it came to the shape of things, she was always like, I don't want to be prescriptive and you just, I want to make sure that I feel these things in these spots, but however you want to achieve that, you go ahead and do that however you want. And I think that's such a freeing uh, place to be as a creative because you're allowed to be given very clear directions, but at the same time, you're allowed to react to to the screen as as, um, as naturally as you can and, and still put your heart into it. Yeah. I'm so you're going into this, did you have a sense of what the score should be, it was going to be? Did you, go, how did you go into it? How did you work, what was your point of view working through? No, no, I didn't go into it with a, with a specific idea. Um, you know, because my previous, work with composers that's been very collaborative. And I think you really don't know until you get the, the image of that, you know? Then I'm listening to things, I'm listening to more source, um, uh, more existing existing songs. Um, and I don't really focus on score until I've cut it. So I really can't, I don't know how you work, but I, 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 don't, I don't like to back into the music. I like to just try to, try to decide. So I didn't have a sense of what the tones were. I didn't have a sense of what it would be. It was really a true, true collaboration. And I said, I'm so proud of you, because it was such a short amount of time. You're so brilliant and so young. And um, I just feel like you're a genius. And I'm so happy that you collaborated with me on this. And years from now, people will be like, no Chris Powers did that thing? Like, oh, wow, that Chris Powers did that So that's how I was here. I love working with you. And um, I just feel incredibly proud of all the people on stage. But as I listen to Chris talk, I think of Bradford Young, our cinematographer. I think of Aisha Coley, our casting director. Yeah. Yeah. I think of our editor, Spencer Abrick, who's edited every single thing I've ever made, from I Will Follow the Middle of Nowhere to Selma to the Jay-Z video, the product commercial, 13, this, Queen Sugar. Like, I have one guy I sit in the dark with. Um, sometimes I wish it was Idris, but it's not. It's Spencer. <laughs> and, and, uh, I always tell a joke to Idris, he's like, what are you using for this? I don't know, it works. Um, but, um, but I love sitting with him, and so he cut this piece along with, with Terry Shropshire and, and Michelle, and so it just, it was, a, it was an incredible group of people um, who, you know, the director gets put out front, the writers get put out front, the actors get put out front. We were really held up by a crew that was so magnificent, so, you know, women, people of color, people from all over the country who came and gathered to do this. It was, it was an extraordinary experience. And, um, and so yeah, I wish, I wish we could all stay up here. If we were all sitting there, you wouldn't be sitting there. Um, but they're with us tonight, a great crew. Uh, while you were working on this, it was Central Park Five, and you talked about how you were working on Central Park Five. And, Central Park Five. and then it was When They See Us. And it's a haunting title, and I'm curious why and where it came from, because when you hear When They See Us, it's, it's something that when you see it, you know, we see ourselves in a way, and it's, a, it's about being seen in a way that you haven't seen something before. I, it, I just wanna know where you got to that and how it happened. Well, I have to really shout out Netflix, because when you've been focusing on a project about the Central Park Five, which is a famous case, and when all of our materials, all of our signs, call sheets, everyone is talking about, basically we call it Central Park Five, and then about like three months before editing is over, your filmmaker comes and says, yeah, I don't want to call it Central Park Five. Excuse me? <laughs> you know, we've been promoting Central Park Five, we've been talking about Central Park Five, everyone just thinks it's gonna be called Central Park Five. And Nina and Allison are here from Netflix, and they were my incredible executives there. I don't really say that about our executives. I really <laughs> don't say that lightly. Really incredible executives, um, as well as that marketing team at Netflix who is ride or die. There was one woman I was talking to, I'm going to say her name, she's not even here, her name is Denise Martin. And I remember saying to her, she's a Netflix marketer, I remember saying to her, it's not Central Park Five, and I need you to go back and tell everyone at Netflix. <laughs> and I said, we need to think of something else, it's not Central Park Five. 
She said, well, why, what? And I told her, Central Park Five I associate with um, a monitor that was given to these men and thrust upon them. Did they not choose it? That's not who they are. They are Corey, Anton, Raymond, Kevin, and Yusef. They have mothers, they have dreams, they have, they, have, they have families, they have beating hearts, they were human beings. They were not this moniker, and I didn't want it. I wanted something that brought you into the heart of them and the heart of this film. And the, this film is about love. It's about these mothers pulling these boys out of the darkness and holding on to them even as they walk through this incredible pain. And, um, and it needs to be something that also could comment on the larger piece. Because the reason why I wanted to do this is that this case is one famous case that allows you, by the time you're done with those four parts of the, of the, of the, of the series, to understand every, every part of the criminal justice system. Part one that you saw is about police interaction of young black men on the street. How that interaction, that presumption of guilt happens, is about precinct behavior. It's about your rights. It's about all of these things that we get caught in. Part two is about bail. It's about trials. It's about defense attorneys and prosecutors, and how all of that is tilted away from being for many people of color, particularly black men. Part three is about about juvenile detention. It's about post incarceration. The way that we strip rights from people who've done their time. We say, this is the time you need, need to do for your crime. And after they do that time, okay, you come out, but you're still not a full citizen. Can't vote, can't get a job, can't get a student loan, can't move, can't get an apartment, can't get anything, right? This is like an indentured servitude. And then you go to part four, and it's about incarceration itself. Um, as we go through the journey of Corey Wise, and when you're locked in part four, and you're doing the time with them. You're in there with them doing it. So by the time you're done with the whole series, you have experienced all of the parts of the criminal justice system. Yes, it's this very famous case, but you've experienced a lot more. So that was the goal of this, right? When they see us, it allows you to see all of them. To see all of them. The thing that struck me most watching it was it was about these five boys. Uh, and then young men, but it was about so many. And all I could think was, this has happened again and again and again and again. And it was just, uh, I hadn't thought about it that way as you just described it, but it's uh, just devastating. Um, uh, the fear that everyone had in the city, these rapes were happening again and again, this woman, young woman is killed, the fear that the police have, the fear that the politicians have, the fear that the lawyers have, and then that they choose these black boys to, and they saddle them with all of their fear, and all of a sudden you see what happens with, with these children. Um, it, the injustice is just impossible to imagine, and yet you manage to portray it so beautifully on film. And I'm just curious, how did you begin the process of saying, okay, I know I want to do it now, and here's how I'm gonna do it. Like, I'm just curious about what, what your approach was. Did you have a writer's room? Did you, what was your, how did you start to structure this thing to see it the way you just described it? Mm -hmm. I uh, knew that it would be, it would start um, in the park. It was later that I decided that you would see a few minutes before the end of the park, but I always knew it wasn't gonna be kind of a grizzled detective trying to figure out the case, or it wasn't going to be uh, pulled backwards, as it wasn't gonna be you know, in the present with flashbacks. We would be with them in the park. Um, so I had, um, um, a real idea of the general structure, and then um, put together a very small writer's room of three people. Um, uh, Robin Swicourt, Attica Locke, who's here, she's fantastic, she wrote everything <laughs> three, incredible. Um, and Michael Starberry, and um, we, we, we just started to, to wrestle with the material. Um, I always knew, but I didn't know about the structure that Corey would be last. And the reason why I knew that is because he told me. When I first sat down with Corey Wise, 2015, I said, I'm gonna make this, um, a film about the Central Park Five, and I, you know, I just wanna to talk to you about, I'm thinking about making this film, I was considering making it. He said, one thing you should know is not Central Park Five, it's four plus one. Not Central Park Five, it's four plus one. I had a different experience than the rest of them. And I always wanted to honor that. If I did, if, if I did nothing else, I wanted people to know what he went through, and that was different from what the other boys went to juvenile detention. When in the episode you saw him get taken off the street near the barbershop, they go past the old man who's always reading the newspaper, and, and Gerald's like, that guy's always, always there. And he says, 
by Jesus that were always there. He's always there just before the cops take him off the street. The man reading the newspaper, by the way, is Raymond, Raymond Santana Sr., the real one. The one that Joe was always with. Anyway, um, so they pass him by, and Corey gets arrested and taken off the street. That man never went home for another 13 years. From that moment, he never went home. His mother could never make bail. He never stepped foot out of the state's custody after that moment, taken off the street to go with his friend. He wasn't even on the list. So that whole thing is real. So when he looks me in the eye and tells me it's not four, it's one, and he is willing to tell me his story, what you see in episode four, for those of you who saw it, is maybe 60% of what he experienced. I've read the, the, re the medical files and, the, and the, the, the prison records. It's I'm scarred by it, it's too much. It's too much to say and it's too much to show. And the fact that you have this beautiful human being that comes out and then somehow leads his life and interacts with people with so much grace. When he tells me it's four plus one, it's four plus one. So I knew the last episode was gonna be just him. And it was about getting from the park to his prison cell. And how we would you know, kind of modulate everything in between. Uh, for <laughs> Uh, a question for, for each of you, and you can answer in any order you like, but I'm just curious, what, what was for each of you the most surprising experience so far being part of this project? Uh, for me, it's, every, it's how many people come up and um, start talking to me and then they start crying, <laughs> and then I feel sort of responsible for them. And it's everyone, I'm in auditions, and they're casting people who I'm supposed to be auditioning, and they start talking about it, and for 20 minutes they're crying, and then I'm like, am, am I gonna do this on Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the impact it's had on so many people, it's incredible. I would probably say the most surprising thing was the global reach. I mean, because when you show up, you you show up to serve this story and serve the men. So, and, and every day you walk away from the set just trying to hold on to your emotions and a little bit of your mind. Um, and so you're not thinking the long game. You're in the moment, and sometimes we had the men or their families on set. You wanna, you, there's such a responsibility that you have in that moment to handle this material with care. And, you know, head down. You know, we all showed up every day ready to serve the story and serve these men. And then you look up and you like, they saw it in how many countries? We got how many people watching on that? Wait, what just happened? Because that was never the I thank you, two in the front. I got two. I got two right here. <laughs> never the goal was to say, guys, huddle around, okay? We're gonna build this thing and then this is what's gonna happen. It wasn't that. It wasn't everything. It was just being of service. And God was so kind that he allowed so many people across the country to be able to lean in to these boys' stories and everything that has happened with them since. And that is the part that I absolutely did not see coming. I didn't see it, but I welcome it. <laughs> I guess the um, most surprising thing for me, um, it's kind of, kind of the same thing you guys said, but uh, it's, it's really just how how this has impacted people, you know? I've, 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 I've been looking at kind of, I don't know, I guess I'm a film buff, I guess. Um, but, but I've kind of watched so many movies and watched so many series because, you know, I'm an actor, that's what actors do. Um, and, and I've kind of never seen something have such an impact on so many people um, and, and, and so many people that they connect to it personally. You know, um, so many people come up to me in the street and, and it's crazy because I never thought that it was going to, you know, kind of, I mean, these people are like deeply affected by what they saw. And, and it's, it's kind of an insane, an insane thing to think about. I mean, like me and uh, Ethan, you know, <laughs> Probably wasn't a smart thing to do, but we decided to take a stroll down. I don't even know why you did this, and I'm so upset. Tell the story very briefly, and okay. you were there too. 
This yeah. is unnecessary. You should not have done it. Go tell well, okay, so. <laughs> Now I'm all mad. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, okay, so. I don't, I don't live here, so whenever I'm out here, I try to connect with the homies. Um, <laughs> and so, I, I, I hit up Ethan, said, what are you doing? He said nothing, so he swung by my hotel, and um, he said, he realized that, you know, there were a couple places he wanted to go that were pretty close to the hotel. So we're like, okay, we can walk there. The hotel that I was staying at was right around the corner from Hollywood Boulevard. And um, the Lion King premiere was going on. So me, you know, being a newcomer to Hollywood, I'm like, Hey, let's stop by the Lion King premiere. Let's just walk past and see if we get a glimpse of Beyonce. I don't know. <laughs> um, the place that we are going to, we, so we get on Hollywood Boulevard, we see you know, the tennis set up, everything like that. It's like, okay, cool. The place that we're trying to go to is 15 it's a 15 minute walk. We don't get there until an hour later. Because when I tell you, I mean, it makes sense. Hollywood Boulevard is the place people go, tourists, things like that. But so many people stopped us in the streets. So many. I mean, it was like, one, two, hi. One, two, hi. One, two, I mean, we, every couple of steps, people were stopping us, you know, trying to take pictures. Oh, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we actually concocted a plan to um, pretend like we were on the phone. And uh, we were both, you know, standing next to each other, pretending we were on the phone. And uh, we see two, a couple, a few people kind of notice us, and we walk past them. But then maybe three minutes later, we hear footsteps running up behind us, and they like, you guys are really on the phone. <laughs> the lesson is, when you're hot young actors in Hollywood, you don't just walk down Hollywood. It's so, it's so crazy, because, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming, it's crazy as it seems. All of these people are deeply impacted by it. I mean, it's all love, and it's, it's just really seeing how something that you've created has impacted so many people and helped inspire change, and it's just an unbelievable honor, really. We have, we have a, a, a few more minutes. Does that, anyone else have a, something they want to say about the experience of being in this extraordinary piece of work? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Just one Please. thing. It's, this is totally personal and selfish, but I just want to say this, say this real quick. I'd say a year ago, I could show you on my phone, I have things that'll never happen in my life. I, I said two things, and then the third thing was, I'll never be hired by Ava DuVernay. <laughs> and two weeks later, I was on the phone with her. mean to, to be uh, dramatic, but this is a moment, and this is a, a, a an incredibly rare thing that you have all done, and uh, I, I'm honored to get to sit up here with you and talk about it, um, and I'm touched that uh, that you uh, you invited me. But I gotta tell you that you guys, uh, all of you, and Ava, I just cannot believe what you have done. Uh, you topped yourself, and I didn't know how you could possibly do it. Uh, amazing work. <laughs>